We've had an argument now for um, Freiman's theorem in the finite fields case, and much of that argument works just as well for the case of subsets of Z. But um, as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, in the case of subsets of Z, the structure we get is not something quite as nice as a subspace of FP to the N, but rather we have to consider these objects Bohr sets. And um, in this video I want to say a few things that will give you some idea of what Bohr sets actually look like and some of their properties. There's actually quite a lot more that one can say than I will say, but uh, this certainly is, is a good start and it's enough for several applications. So without further ado, um, I share my screen and here we go. So uh, let's call it the size and structure of bore sets. And I'm talking particularly, uh, perhaps I'll say that in, in cyclic groups, so bore sets inside uh, Zn. And in fact, I'll um, consider the case where n is prime, because that just makes things simpler. Uh, so let's deal with the size first of all. Um, so we'll go straight away with the following lemma. Um, let let, let n be a prime. Actually, no, this one, this one works. That's a big pardon. This one works for an arbitrary uh, abelian group. So let G be a finite abelian group. Let uh, K be a set of little k characters on G, of course. Uh, let delta be greater than zero, and let uh, oh, what is it? I think it's easy to say this, and let delta be greater than zero. Then the Bohr set B K delta has size at least delta to the k times the size of g, or equivalently has density at least delta to the k, which actually is a nicer way of thinking about it in my view, but um, some people uh, like to think about cardinalities, so I'm, I'm just writing that. Uh, the proof is quite simple. Um, so what we'll do is the following. Um, first of all, let's just give names to the characters in K. So we'll call it Chi1 up to Chi K. Um, and uh, let U1 up to UK be chosen independently and uniformly at random from the it's sort of natural to say the half open interval naught one actually what i'm really doing is taking um the circle of z as a r quotiented out by z but uh, let's call it this and let's see which will be a random set that depends on u up to uk be the set of all x belonging to G such that uh, chi i of x belongs to E of the interval from ui to ui plus delta. Um, doesn't really matter. Uh, for i equals 1 to k. Now if I fix uh, x and i, the probability that um, <coughs> chi i, <coughs> excuse me, chi i of x belongs to this uh, arc here 
which doesn't really matter whether it's closed or open, is exactly delta. And since these probabilities are independent as for i equals 1 to k, that means that the probability that x belongs to c is equal exactly to delta to the k. Uh, therefore, the expected size of c is exactly delta to the k times the size of g. Uh, but c minus c, so supposing chi i of x belongs to this arc here and chi i of y also belongs to this arc here, then chi i of x minus y is going to belong to e of this interval minus this interval. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll say it in slightly more detail, but that will equal, uh, is the interval minus delta up to delta. So I'm going to write that C minus C is a subset of B, uh, which from which it follows that, um, oh, so perhaps I should say, first of all, pick C such, or pick U1 up to UK, so such that, uh, the size of C really is, well, at least delta to the K times the size of G. And then what I was saying before, uh, but C minus C is a subset of B, and it's at least as big as C, so the size of B is also greater than the delta to the K of G. And just in case you don't find this statement here completely obvious, just notice that although this is that's the end of the proof, but a little bit of, sort of rough working would be to say that if um, if if chi i of x belongs to and chi of y both belong to e of u i u i plus delta, then chi i of x minus y, which equals chi i of x chi i of y, perhaps I call it chi i of minus y, actually, I think it's a little bit clearer, um, belongs to e of actually minus delta up to delta. Um, so if that's true for all i, which it is if x and y both belong to, to, to c, then we get it. Um, chi i of x, well then we get that x minus y belongs to b. So that's a little bit of extra reasoning there. Um, <clears throat> okay, next thing I want to prove is just a really simple lemma, but it comes in handy from time to time. Um, let g be a finite abelian group. Let uh, delta greater than zero. Uh, let delta and um, eta be greater than zero, and let k be some subset of g hat, another some set of characters. Then the bore set be k delta plus the bore set bk eta is a subset of the ball set bk delta plus eta and well the proof if chi belongs to k uh, and well x belongs to b k delta and y belongs to b k eta then chi of x plus y equals chi x chi of y 
which belongs to the interval or the arc E of minus delta delta times E of minus eta eta, which is a, equal to E of minus delta plus eta delta plus eta. So that one's straightforward. Uh, the next thing I want to prove, which is the first thing that I, one might call a structural property, because what I've talked about so far is first of all a, a cardinality property, and secondly something about um, adding ball sets together. But uh, now we're going to see that ball sets contain long arithmetic progressions. Um, so. Um, Let K subset or let N be prime and let K as a subset of Zn hat, the dual group, be a, a set of size. Uh, let's call it non zero. Actually, I think I add non zero. I need that in the next uh, lemma, but anyway, not, not, it's not really important one way or the other. Characters of size little k. Um, then the four set B k delta. contains an arithmetic progression uh, mod n that is of length at least one plus when I say length I mean size perhaps I'll say size The cardinality of the arithmetic progression of size at least one plus two delta n to the one over k, one over little k floor. Uh, I think that's the band we're going to get. Um, if it's not, I reserve the right to change it slightly at the end. But that's the rough way it depends. Uh, so <clears throat> By the first lemma, if um, epsilon to the k is greater than one over n, then the ball set B k epsilon contains more than one element. And so contains a non-zero element. That's the really good thing I care about. But uh, we can say slightly more than that because um, if that's true for all, so that's equivalent to saying epsilon greater than 1 over n to the 1 over k. Uh, if that's true for all epsilon that are strictly greater than um, n to the minus 1 over k, then um, it's also going to be true when epsilon actually equals n to the minus 1 over k. Uh, this is just a, a tiny little convenience rather than something important. But um, the reason for that is that if you've got a whole bunch of so as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, um, the ball sets will get strictly smaller. Um, and uh, if you think about the conditions that an element of the ball set has to satisfy, they're all of the form um, chi i of x belongs to uh, well 
oh, I better write it down here, they're all going to be of the form chi i of x belongs to uh, e of minus epsilon epsilon. And um, so if that's true of all epsilon bigger than some, strictly bigger than some um, number, because these are closed intervals, it's going to be true when epsilon actually equals that number. So just out of convenience, really, uh, I'm going to say, therefore, um, b k n to the minus 1 over k contains a non-zero element x, say. And so we have that uh, but then by the previous lemma if m modulus is less than or equal to um, because minus x is also going to have the same property so if the modulus of m is less than or equal to uh, delta n to the 1 over k then mx also belongs to b uh, belongs belongs to bk delta over uh, because x belongs to bk n to the minus 1 over k so when I take m of those things it's going to be in the sum of m of this lot so I multiply that n to the minus 1 over k by at most delta times n to the 1 over k so I get up to at most delta as I say I'm using the fact that if x belongs to this set it's symmetric so minus x must also belong to it um, so we get that uh, minus what should I call it rx minus r minus 1x all the way up to rx is a subset of b k delta if r equals um, delta n 1 over k floor and then the size of that set is 1 plus 2 delta n to the 1 over k. I suppose I need some kind of restrictions on um, some sort of trivial restrictions on delta and so on to make sure that this thing isn't actually bigger than n or something like that. But uh, basically, that um, for all reasonable choices of parameter, everything works nicely. OK, so the last result is actually rather more interesting than the ones that we've had so far. Although these are very useful and important results, but this last one actually tells you something about what a Bohr set looks like. We've got a little bit about that. We've got some clue that it contains, and using this same argument, we can actually see that it contains quite a lot of arithmetic progressions, especially if you're prepared for that length not to be quite as big as the maximum. But um, now we're going to see something that sort of explains that you would expect that to be the case. Um, but just before I start, I just want to remind you that a lattice is a subset uh, lambda of r to the k that uh, it's, a, it's a, a discrete subgroup of r to the k that spans the whole of r to the k. So the obvious lattice is just the lattice of points with integer coordinates, but uh, it's convenient sometimes to generalize that concept. The discrete subgroup that generates as a vector space all of r to the k. In other words, it doesn't live inside some subspace of dimension k minus 1. Uh, so now let's state the lemma.
let n be prime. Let uh, k inside zn hat be a set of characters of size little k. And let um, uh, let's I want another integer, so let r be a positive integer, and let naught less than delta less than one over two r. Then the ball set. Uh, B K delta is R isomorphic, so Freiman isomorphic of order R to um, some lattice intersected with minus delta N up to delta N. Uh, And the lattice, uh, sorry, delta delta n up to the k, and it lives inside um, r to the k. So you see that if you regard Freiman isomorphic sets as being basically the same thing, then what this Bohr set looks like is the intersection of some convex body, which is actually quite a simple convex body. It's just a, a box um, or a a cube of uh, dimension k with a lattice and if you want you can apply some linear transformation so that the lattice just becomes the normal integer lattice and the box becomes a bit sort of skew so another way of thinking about it is it's, you take some sort of um, linear image of a k-dimensional cube and intersect it with a, an integer lattice and that gets you um, a set that, that gets you a description of your Bohr set. And so because of that, you can see why it should contain lots of long arithmetic progressions and things like that. Um, and indeed, because there are only k dimensions, that also all, sort of explains, if you've got n points sitting inside some k-dimensional set and they're all forming some kind of lattice, you would expect the longest arithmetic progression to have length at least something like n to the 1 over k. Um, right, so let's uh, let's prove this. Um, so what we're going to do first, I'm just going to construct the lattice. And uh, so let k be the set u1 up to uk. And I should just say that here I'm doing the kind of non-natural identification of zn hat with zn. So ui i'm thinking of as an element of zn but i'm it's sort of acting as a character so uh, i'm identifying it with a character that takes x to e of well to e to the 2 pi i x ui over n sorry about the duplicate use of i there um and uh then Let lambda be n times z to the k, so the set of all points, integer points, where all the coordinates are multiples of n. Uh, no, sorry, I didn't want to say quite that, so almost that. Be the lattice generated by Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm assuming, I forgot so where I actually wanted to say it, I forgot to say it. So I'm assuming that uh, all the characters in K are non-empty, because if you've got a non, if you've got a non-zero, I mean, because you've got zero in here, it makes no difference to this set, so it's pointless to, to include zero. So let lambda be the lattice generated by n z to the K and the vector u1 up to UK, which has no non-zero coordinates. So what does lambda consist of? 
it actually consists of all integer points that are multiples of u1 up to uk mod n because what you can do here you can you can if you want to generate a, a vector in lambda you just pick some multiple of this and you pick some coordinate with uh, so some vector with coordinates that are multiples of n and you subtract that from the multiple of this so you can see in that way you can get any vector that has coordinates that are uh, any vector that is a multiple of this um, or is congruent to a multiple of this mod n, let's put it that way, any vector in z to k. Uh, so now I want to claim that this works. In other words, if I take that particular lambda and I intersect it with my, this box here, minus delta n up to delta n, I'm going to get um, a set that is R isomorphic to the Bohr set BK delta. So first, let me, so now I'm going to define the isomorphism. So given x belonging to BK delta, define phi x to be the vector u1x up to ukx. And I haven't yet said what this notation means, uh, where uix is the uh, residue of least absolute value in, uh, well, congruent to uix mod n. So technically uix is an equivalence class of, uh, or the residue class of integers. So I'm picking the least absolute value one. So um, by definition of the Bohr set, um, the absolute value of uix is less than or equal to delta n. Okay, for each i, let's put that in. So, um, but also uix, uh, I mean this vector here, because it is congruent to the vector without the curly brackets, just u1x up to ukx, it is an element of the lattice. So phi x does indeed belong to... Um, lambda intersect minus delta n delta n to the k. Now let's check that phi is a homomorphism. Um, if uh, x1 plus xr equals y1 plus yr, then um, ui x1, so I'm just picking some arbitrary i there, plus ui xr is going to be congruent mod n to ui y1 plus plus ui yr mod n. Um, but both sides have absolute value at most um, 
delta r, which is less than a uh, delta r n, which is less than n over 2. So they're congruent mod n, they have absolute value less than n over 2, so they are equal. So that gives you that uh, phi is a homomorphism of order r. Now we want to invert it. So now let um, let's call it z1 up to zk belong to lambda intersect minus delta n delta n to the k then there is some um, because I've, I've described what the um, elements of this lattice are like they are I'll just remind you that they are numbers that they are vectors that are congruent to a multiple of um, u1 up to uk um, mod n and of course they have to have uh, this, this absolute value so then there is some x in uh, zn such that z1 up to zk is congruent to u1x up to ukx mod n and uh, we also have that um, these and each uix belongs to minus delta n delta n so x belongs to the bore set b k delta that follows easily from this assertion here um, and now we can um, So that's actually proved that our map is a surjection, but uh, also note that uh, x is uniquely defined by the condition that uh, ui x is congruent to z1 because ui is non-zero. Um, sorry, that u1x, I mean, because u1 is non-zero. So the map um, z1 up to zk maps to u1 to the minus 1 z1 inverts phi. And also, it is a group homomorphism, or it's a restriction of a group homomorphism, so it is a primal homomorphism of order R, uh, therefore phi is a Freiman isomorphism of order R. And that completes the proof. The technical details here are not maybe quite as important as just the basic idea of what the lattice is. You know, once you've written down the lattice, it's just a question of checking that it works. Uh, so what the lattice is, and well, even once you've written the lattice, it's fairly the, the, the definition of the um, Isomorphism also more or less writes itself. There's not anything else sensible that one could write down. Okay, um, so I'll stop this video there, but uh, in the next video, which uh, we'll then just take this information and it'll be rather short, actually. We'll just re more or less repeat the argument that we had for um, Freiman's theorem for um, subsets of fp to the n 
and just see what the argument gives in the case of subsets of Z. But I will stop there for this video.